Um, so as uh, Tim indicated, my name is Peggy Hanrahan, and I was uh, privileged to serve 12 years altogether uh, for the city of Gainesville, six as mayor and six as a member of the city commission. And prior to that, I uh, both had a consulting engineering career that continues to some extent and uh, worked for the county government as well for six and a half years. So I'm older than I feel, I guess. <laughs> Uh, maybe not older than I look. I'd like to encourage folks who maybe are sitting there going, really, is this going to be a presentation? If you can't see the screen, it's going to be a frustration. So if you'd like to move forward, uh, feel free to, because I don't want to uh, have folks sort of frustrated because they're behind a post or whatever. Um, so just, I'm going to start out, and I will, uh, in just a moment, I'm going to sort of go through some of this terminology because it's actually very inaccessible, I think, for most people, although I was reading Tim's very fine piece last night, and I felt a little bit better because we have a lot of struggles around the term feed-in tariff. And then I saw that it's actually a direct translation from the German, which is Stroman Speisung Getzen. Stroman Spice und Gitzitz. So it, it's not as bad as that, I don't think. <laughs> okay, Germans are sort of famous for stringing long words together. So um, Gainesville is actually right, we call it the heart of Florida. And as you know, Florida is that little uh, sticking into the sea down at the bottom of the US. Um, Americans are particularly bad at geography, so in case you all are as well. Uh, we're right in the heart of the state, but we are not a coastal city, and so we don't have some of the potential renewable opportunities that some other parts of our state might have. And I believe, or not that I'm unbiased, but we're a very beautiful city. In fact, we're often recognized as, a, as one of America's really high quality places to live with um, wonderful cultural and natural resources. Our city's about 130,000 people, and we're about half of our countywide population, of about 60 square miles. So it's actually relatively um, dispersed. It's not a really high density city. And um, we're also, you know, Florida is a very populous state. We're the fourth largest state in the US. Uh, we're a relatively small community, just the 14th largest in the state. Um, and it's also worth noting that we're the home of the University of Florida, which is the flagship university for our state, which means that we have about 50,000 uh, university students, as well as about 16 or 17,000 community college students. It's the fifth largest university in the US. So that has a substantial impact on many things in the community. Someone asked me the other day, do students get politically involved in issues in Gainesville? And I said, yeah, bar closing hours, for example. <laughs> Very active on that particular one. Um, and, and things come and go, of course, but it has an impact on the type of city that we are in the, and obviously the political landscape, not just because of the students, but maybe more predominantly because of the faculty and staff and sort of the year-round residents who have, have an impact. Now, from a utility perspective, it's important to mention, and um, it, it's hard for me to even fully describe the way utilities are knit together, regulated, run in the US, and so I could never do it about Canada. And I've been asking various folks questions like, well, who sets the rates here? Or who actually governs, uh, is it NPower, NPower, is it? EPCOR. EPCOR, okay, EPCOR. I'm going to have to learn that between now and now. Uh, um, and I don't know all of those details, and I'm not even entirely clear as to, uh, you know, it, even in the US, it's a complicated landscape in terms of the decision making structures for who can implement uh, rules and regulations and so on in a, in, a, in a relationship to a utility. And so I will assume that amongst you, you will figure those things out. But it happens in Gainesville that we own our utility. And um, it's, a, it's a relatively good size public utility across the US where we're in the top 40 or so in terms of the size of public utilities. And also a very strong utility. We're a top 20 
in terms of our bond rating by all three rating agencies. So we're uh, proud of that. And as mayor, I sat as the chair of the board of our public utility again for those six years and for six years prior was, was on the board. So um, obviously cities are really key, not just in terms of utilities, but also in terms of all of the other energy related decisions that occur around transportation, around land use, around um, all of the zoning and building codes and all of those kinds of things. And so for those of you, and I know there are a number who have uh, input and advice to your municipal government, um, there are many, many solutions to consider. And I, I'm always one, you know, some people become an advocate for, you know, this set of policies or that set of policies. I don't think there's any one solution myself. I mean, I, I'll, sh I'll make, I hope, a compelling case that feed-in tariffs have an important role to play. But if for whatever reason your landscape is such that you can't or don't or, or uh, otherwise choose, your community chooses not to move forward, that doesn't mean that you uh, don't have many opportunities in, in other areas. There we are making a transportation. Uh, that's a, a, a bicycle throughway in Gainesville. A greenway, we call it. Um, this is the Hogtown Creek. Gainesville started out as Hogtown, which is, you can see, not, also not a great marketing uh, <laughs> term. Uh, and I, I do like to just mention we're, um, we're set in a very rural and very natural area. And I really think one of the key assets I heard as we went around the room is the engagement of uh, rural interests, agricultural interests, uh, First Nations interests. People, um, I mean, I, I personally, I was four times I ran, I was always supported by the Sierra Club and, and groups like that. But I'm sensing that the political lay of the land, not just here, but really everywhere today, you need to have um, deep interconnections and broad-based support for these types of changing policies. And I think having, and labor, I heard someone from labor as well, having sort of all of those different interests at the table, I think helps move us uh, forward in terms of these kinds of policies. So there's our downtown Kelly power plant, uh, owned by the people it serves is the motto of our public utility. And I think it's really to some great extent true if you imagine um, the uh, fact that every two weeks we meet in public session, broadcast on television, and if people have concerns or complaints about the utility, they come on down and they talk to the mayor and the members of the commission about them. So that's uh, lots of fun, I think. Uh, so just a little bit, and it's interesting, oftentimes when we talk about energy policy, one of the motivators for communities is sometimes, well, we'd like to have more uh, local economic impact from this large segment of our of our economy. Now in Alberta, obviously, <laughs> it's hard to get away from already having local, you know, whether it's coal or oil or, or natural gas, it's all local, right? So you don't have that argument as much. Uh, but in Gainesville, it's very much an issue. We get most of our energy from coal, and that comes from West Virginia. It comes in on trains and we send out of our community about $200 million a year to the state of West Virginia purchasing coal. So uh, that's of some concern to our community. Uh, natural gas, of course, and um, I was reading a paper I think Tim wrote last night, depending on your perspective, natural gas is either a very clean um, uh, fuel or else, you know, in comparison to some other fuels, but, but the big issue for us is it's a very volatilely priced fuel that you, you know, you, if you're heavily reliant on natural gas, there are times like now, for example, that it's actually pretty cost effective. And then there are other times where it spikes through the roof and you have uh, very little control over it. Um, we do own a portion of a nuclear plant, the Crystal River plant, uh, obviously. And in the US, there's something of a resurgence of interest in nuclear and investment in nuclear. Uh, for a, a community like ours, expanding nuclear resources is not a great option and not a likely option. So uh, that's uh, not something that we see as a growth area. Tiny bit of oil. And this has been historically maybe about 1% renewable, uh, both in solar and also in landfill gas. So uh, now what I want to sort of bring your attention to is that as I mentioned, we're a public utility with our own generating resources. We have uh, three power plants. 
uh, including a combined cycle uh, natural gas plant downtown, which I showed you, and also a new combined heat and power plant, which just services, um, which is also natural gas, but it just services uh, one of our key hospitals. But we purchase about 15 and a half percent of our energy off the grid from Progress Energy, and we'd prefer not to. Uh, because, of course, as I've described, we have sort of a, a local orientation in terms of how we make decisions about our utility, where the energy comes from. This is a mix of their generating resources, which includes all of the above. And it's uh, less economically advantageous in comparison to generating our own resources. So that's, so that's an issue. Now, uh, many people ask, and I think this is one of the key questions, well, why did Gainesville adopt a feed-in tariff, or what was it? that made you start to consider expanding your access to renewable resources. And it really started with a very challenging debate around um, our next generation of energy supply. And um, the initial recommendation from our utility director and his staff was to build a new coal power plant. And this was in 2002, and it was actually uh, for me, it's a little bit of a challenge to really fully understand all of those dynamics only because I was actually term limited in that time frame. I was off the commission and you don't have all of the same access to the insider considerations and pros and cons and so on and so forth. But I'll tell you just kind of knowing both our utility and our political structure and our community, if the recommendation had been simply to expand our existing coal plant by a small percentage in order to meet our future needs, you know, maybe 50 or 100 megawatts, that might have been a saleable recommendation. Because, you know, again, it's, it's far less expensive. It was something we've been doing. Um, we had some uh, environmental goals and objectives that obviously are challenged to do with coal, but there was at that time an awful lot of discussion around quote unquote clean coal and newer technologies and, and all of this kind of thing. Uh, the, the thing that changed the dynamic of the discussion was that the utility actually suggested really overshooting our own needs and building a 600 megawatt power plant, which is about the equivalent amount of power that we fully generate today. So we'd be about doubling our generation resources entirely with coal. Uh, now, roll your mind back to 2002. Um, it was sort of right before the whole Enron set of circumstances uh, hit. There was an orientation toward deregulating power markets, which have not been deregulated in Florida. I gather they are here in Alberta. Um, the, our governor was Jeb Bush, whose brother is George Bush. Uh, I mean, George, yeah, George W. Uh, <laughs> sorry, there are so many Bushes around. Um, that, uh, that it was a very different dynamic, and you can kind of understand why um, that recommendation might have been made. Well, some th key things changed. Um, uh, notably for Florida, in 2005, Governor Bush, I'm sorry, 2004, I guess, 2006. Yeah, two, I'm sorry, 2006. Uh, governor Bush was term limited out. A new governor was elected, and he was a much, um, sort of his persona, his self-identification was much more green, much more environmentally ori oriented. Uh, his name is Charlie Crist. He was actually just unceremoniously uh, not sent to the US Senate, but that's another discussion. Uh, that's actually quite a, kind of an interesting discussion having to do with him becoming an independent. He had been a Republican, he became an independent. He was beat by sort of a Tea Party guy, but that's details. Um, but anyway, he adopted a moratorium on new coal plants in 2007. So that obviously changed the lay of the land for us. But also, and, and importantly, that 600 megawatt recommendation got people really talking about, is this what we want to do? Is this a good investment? Is this uh, sustainable on any number of levels? Is it economically sustainable? Is it, is it socially or environmentally sustainable? 